Eva, where does your love for filmmaking come from? Well, I love you. I, we've not had a chance to have, spend a lot of time together, but I'm just such an admirer of your work and what you've done in the world. So just thank you for taking the time to speak with me. And thank you, Google, my for pleasure. having us. Um, my aunt, Denise Sexton, uh, who was an African-American woman from Compton, California, who loved movies. Um, she was single, didn't have any kids. She was my mother's sister. And she um, just was a movie freak, loved plays, loved, loved, loved art, uh, loved painting, sculpture. Um, but none of that existed for her to actually uh, consume in Compton. So she would take the bus uh, to different parts of Los Angeles. She worked at night as a nurse, as a registered nurse, so that she could um, consume art and be a fan and appreciator of art during the day. And I was the oldest of her nieces. And uh, I was fortunate enough to be taken along um, on those excursions. And they really ignited my imagination and led me to where I am. And you didn't start off as a filmmaker. What was that moment where you decided, this is it, I want to be a director? Yes, I was a marketer. Uh, I marketed films. I was a publicist for films. Um, I worked with you know uh, many beautiful filmmakers, uh, mostly all men, Steven Spielberg. and. Michael Mann, and I was on the set of a Michael Mann film one day, and he was making this film called Collateral uh, with uh, Tom Cruise and Jamie Foxx and Jada Pinkett and a young Javier Bardem, uh, who I couldn't get anyone to write an article about. Um, and, um, and he was making that film in, in, in central Los Angeles, where I'm from, on these newfangled cameras called digital cameras. I was like, what is that? And, um, and I thought it was uh, something that I could do, the audacity. I was, you know, in my late 20s, early 30s, and I'm watching him direct, and something hit me saying, I want to do that, and I can do that. And so I, um, I started making films with my own money on vacations and weekends while I was running my agency, uh, my PR and marketing firm. And yeah, I, made, I picked up a camera for the first time when I was in 32. Yeah. You've created so many projects. It's 20 years ago. I know. Wow. <laughs> Just put that together for myself. I still feel, you know, 18, but yeah. <laughs> You've created so many projects that push the boundary in Hollywood. Um, how do you break through those barriers? I just think the ba those boundaries just feel so arbitrary and kind of silly to me. Um, I, don't, I don't take the fact that I'm doing it so seriously. I kind of feel like, why isn't this happening? You know, what, what, what's wrong with you? Uh, what's wrong with us that as an industry in, what was it, 2000, when did we make Selma Fall? 2014, there had never been a major motion picture about Dr. King. I mean, is that actually what we're doing? And so, so it just seems so bizarre to me. I feel like so, so, so often I'm walking around Hollywood, I'm just kind of in bizarro world <laughs> that I, uh, I just go about it as this is work that needs to be done. And, you know, don't really think about it as boundary breaking. Just think of it as, okay, I'm, you know, I'm going to do this. Yeah. But it's not been easy because you've had to create your own system. Yes, yes. That's the challenging part. And that's the part that sometimes gets a little irritating, is that um, you know, the path for us is much different than our white male counterparts, where the things that they want to do, there's an, easy, there's an easier path. None of it's easy. But there's a path, and there's precedent. It's been done before. Someone has done it before. So you don't have to go through that convincing of, this is a film about women. This is a film that centers people of color. This is a film about justice. It can work. Um, it be made by made by me, made by us. That can work. Um, the marketing campaign will reach people who don't watch these specific channels or listen to this radio. You'll have to reach them in a different way, and it can work. It's just a constant, you know. Uh, and even success doesn't doesn't fix it for the next time because you have to start all over again and prove it again and prove it again. That gets challenging. So. We just decided, our whole leadership team from Array is here. Thank you all for driving down from LA. Thanks for, to Google for giving them some seats. Um, is, uh, we'll just do it ourselves. Because it became challenging and exhausting and demoralizing to continually, after success upon success, to have to go in and convince again. And so I know, you know many predecessors who've had to do that through their whole career. And we just decided we will just do it a different way. And what does that mean, do it a different way? Um, outside of the traditional Hollywood system. You know, the Hollywood system is one that I am an artist, I go in, I pitch, 
I try to convince you that my idea is worth your money. Um, you give me the money, you basically control my voice, you control what I do. Um, and if you're good, you make me think that you're not in control of what I'm doing. But, you know, if you're a good artist, you know that there, there are strings attached. There are only certain things you can say, show, do. You have to hold this back. And so it starts to become a group think as you make this work. Um, and I also just think about the marketing piece of it. There have been beautiful films made that haven't been seen by people who should see it. And, you know, that is because part of the system is we make this film to make money. The, 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 the times that we can monetize, the, our biggest points of monetization is that first weekend. And depending on what it does the first weekend, um, decides the, fu the future and fate of the film. Um, but everything doesn't work that way. Every do everything doesn't hit that way, especially as it if, it, if it hasn't been effectively marketed. And so really, the answer to your question is we've tried to create our own liberated territory. I don't have offices on a studio lot. We have our own four building campus that I bought with some wrinkle, my wrinkle in time money. I made a film for Disney, you know about Disney. They pay well. And, um, <laughs> and, and so I bought those buildings, and so that's where we edit, that's where our writer's rooms are. So if anyone decides Ava's too radical, she's saying this, we're sick of women, we're sick of black and brown people, we're done with it, which is where we're going, um, I have that place to go to create my work. That space has a theater um, where we uh, you know, um, craft our own public programming, always free to the, to the public. Um, our, our head of pro public programming is here, where we're, we're programming everything from Iranian cinema to Filipino cinema to whatever was in the movie theater that weekend that with the, with the, with the filmmaker coming in and not doing a Q&A but sitting in the middle of a round of people who've seen it and being in conversation about their work in ways that artists really crave. I mean, that's even another thing in Hollywood. It's, we don't even talk to the people we made the movie for. You know what I mean? We put out the movie, you do a Q&A, you move on, you're on the award circuit, and we're not using cinema as a point of connection, of information, of, of, of driving empathy. We are leaving so much on the table, um, culturally, um, emotionally, spiritually, and economically, and in terms of what it could bring in. So many benefits that aren't being reaped, and that's what we're trying to figure out at Array. Array is like a campus, right? It's always buzzing with young people. You've really and created- And old people. We like old people, people too. <laughs> you've, yeah. you've created this, this ecosystem. Yeah. And what's been your greatest learning? You know, one of the things that, uh, that there are riches in the niches. That, uh, that the gentleman who was on before, uh, the original Black Rock, um, was talking about retirement. And the fact that we are, you know, interested in wellness and longevity and we all want to live long, but we've not thought about, uh, you know, how we're going to do it once we get there as a culture, as a society. You, you apply that to our industry. We make nothing for, we make nothing for people over a certain age. We are told to make, that the sweet spot is this age of guys, white guys, this age who love Marvel. No disrespect to Marvel. I know you're a Marvel filmmaker. <laughs> Marvel. And, um, you know, and that is the sweet spot. If I go into a studio with a pitch like that, I have a much greater chance of getting a yes. If, but but, but what, what about all, all, of, <laughs> all those 60s to 90s? Do they not? What, what, have, what do they do? Do they not watch? <laughs> do they not want to be entertained? Do they not want to be informed, inspired? Um, so we're not telling stories for enough different kinds of people, and that's a lot of what we're incubating at Array. That's what we like to bring in. And I just think, as a businesswoman as well, it's just we are we are uh, neglecting uh, large swaths of society, of the culture, in our storytelling. We're also neglecting what film can do in terms of the, the propulsive act of of art, um, how tapping into emotion is an aesthetic force that powers people to move, to think differently, to behave differently, to buy differently, to want different services. It, it's, it's, it's from story. It's about from the stories we tell one another about ourselves and what we believe. When we are on the topic of business, um, I love to talk about origin, because if you haven't seen it, you really should. Um, it moved me very deeply. And you stepped away from the studio system to do that. Yes. Um, well, when you go into the studio, let me just give you a pro tip. When you go into the studio and you're pitching a movie, don't pitch a movie about cast. <laughs> I want to make a movie about cast. Doesn't 
get you the offers. So we just decided we weren't going to do that. Uh, we, um, you know, uh, headed by Regina Miller, who's our, our head of our, our um, Array Alliance, which is our, our nonprofit and our business development lead, uh, we put together the money uh, through thinking about who would want to make a movie about cast. Instead of me beating my head against the wall with the studio because I want to make a film about King, about the Central Park Five, about cast, about whatever the things that interest me, um, who would be interested in doing it? Who is like-minded? And uh, we went to philanthropists. We went to the Ford Foundation. We went to Lorene Powell Jobs. We went to uh, we went to Melinda Gates. We went to folks whose mission it is uh, uh, to kind of expand and enlarge our notion of, of how we can live together in this world. And we went to them and said, you know, I always, I, I, I always saw these, these nonprofits at the end of documentaries on PBS with the support of the Ford Foundation and wondered, can they support my movie? So we went to them and said, have you ever thought about supporting a narrative film, a film with actors that has something to say? And, and the answer was no, we've never done it, but yes, we will. And so the money came together with Regina in the lead at, in about six months. And you know, Paul, who heads our production company, Paul Garns and I, we were making the film while the money was coming in on the run. And it was the most exhilarating, you know, uh, about 39 days, three countries. The film spans 400 years. Uh, it's something that the studios would never have allowed me to make. Uh, we shot on film. I mean, we did all the things. And, um, and we made something that we're, we're, we're deeply proud of. And now it's about figuring out, you've got the film, now how do you reach people? It's about this distribution, this cinema segregation that really, really um, is a real thing. I'm from Compton, California. There are no movie theaters in Compton, California. I made a film called Selma, predominantly black town. You can't watch Selma in Selma. There's no movie theater there. You take for granted that you can even see the film. And so how do I reach those people? How do I reach the 75-year-old who's nothing's being made for but loved films and just doesn't want to watch a Marvel movie? Like, is there anything for him or her? And then how do I reach them? So these are the problems that we're trying to disrupt in the, in the mainstream industry, but also trying to incubate the array um, to just connect the dots a little more. As a filmmaker, why are you taking on this burden? Because it's one thing to be a filmmaker, it's another thing to be a filmmaker, push against the system, change the system, set up a, a campus, sort of do all of these things. It takes a lot from someone. I've asked that, been asked that question before. I was asked that question, I, I was at the Oscars about three years ago and a very famous filmmaker said to me, you're, 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 you're such a good filmmaker, you'd be a great filmmaker if you stopped doing all that other stuff. And I don't think you should stop doing that other stuff. No, I know you're not saying that, but, but it, made, it made me think and it upset me. Um, it upset me because I think that a part of it is true. You know, I'd love to just t make films. But the truth is I can't. I cannot make the work I want to make without <laughs> making a path for myself because there's no, there's no path. Um, I, I, can't, I can't tell the kind of stories that are important to me and reach the kind of people I want to reach um, because there's no way in the existing system for me to do that consistently at the level that I want to do it. Will someone give me a couple million dollars? Sure. I mean, the cast was a $40 million film that we made. It was really, it should have been 60. It was a $40 million film that we were able to make. Um, you, you, need, you, need, you need to find a way to do it on your own. And so, Yes, I could make all kinds of things inside the studio system, but the things that I want to make, um, there's the, the path needs to be um, the path needs to be it needs to be made, and it's not going to appear. So somebody's got to do it. What do you think that Hollywood is still getting wrong when it comes to representation? Oh, everything. <laughs> um, well, I think one of the things they're getting wrong is the word representation. First of all, I hate the word diversity. I, I, I said that, unfortunately, around a New York Times reporter in the social setting, and there was an article about it. Um, this was like six years ago. I was just like, I'm just, it's a dead word to me. It doesn't mean anything, and the things that it means to some people have been completely distorted and distorted. Um, you know, diversity is really about a sense of belonging. Who, who belongs here? That's all diversity is, but it's, it's, be, it's become diseased with all this other stuff. And it's the same about representation. I mean, representation is the basics. I mean, it's the basics. 
it's not even something to talk about as a badge of honor, I don't think, because if you don't have representation, it's like I said before, what are you doing? If you don't have the base idea in your head that everyone should be able to see themselves in this space, it's just really logical, um, then, 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 then we're not playing with the, same, with the same deck of cards. I think representation is just saying every color should be in the palette. And whether you choose to use it or not, but everyone should have the, the opportunity, the ability to be included in that way. For me, it's going beyond representation into um, this idea of, 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 of once you've got all the colors, what do you say? What are you saying? What are we saying with this work? This is the most powerful medium, film and television. Who, 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 there's too few people saying anything that matters. And that's what people want. That's what people want to attend. That's what people want to buy. That's what people want to use. They want to feel connected emotionally. They want to feel an intimacy. They want to feel cared for. Whether you are a Trumper, that, that's what that whole thing is. He cares for me. He cares about me. You know, he, he, he cares that I, I, I don't have this and I don't want this and I need this and they have it and it's mine. He's tapping into that idea of who's looking out for me. And I think that there's so, a dearth of that in our storytelling now. And if we can ignite that sense of care, that sense of intimacy, that sense of we give a damn about each other, every single piece doesn't have to be that. Sometimes you just want to see people get blown up, I guess. But I think at the core of it, you know, romance, thrillers, action, you're all, they're trying to save the day. They're trying to, remember Die Hard? What was he saving? He was, it was New York City? What was it? It was something he was doing that we cared. We were going along with it because it mattered. Now, the act, you know, our action is just really devoid of what is the freaking story? What are we talking about? But is it because the system doesn't allow it or is it because the audience palette has also changed slightly? No, I don't think it's that. It's absolutely not the audience palette because human beings are human beings. I mean, we... we we, um, we, want, we, we all function the same. Uh, we, we love who we love and we want to protect what we love. And we, um, we I believe that our, 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 our studio system has taken a few big wins of the big swings and overanalyzed it and drained it of the emotion, the intimacy, the humanity. It, it, it got put into kind of a, a, a system, a computer program. And it spits out these are the things that work. Um, and the more you take artists out of that and the more that you micromanage artists, um, the less kind of humanity is, is in, 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 in incorporated in these films. I mean, there's some incredible action films that are filled with art. But when you take out the heart, because you need two more action sequences, because they test better in the test screening, and you know we think the fanboys are going to like that because they say around their friends that that's what they're going to like. Now you've started to have a whole industry that's built around a certain kind of movie, and I think you know, uh, you know, independent films, films by different voices, um, you know, films with heart are are going away. I mean, I remember loving Out of Africa, Kramer versus Kramer, and like. You know, even E.T. couldn't even be made now. It would be really difficult to make that film now. You know, Jaws, you know, in, with the same script, with the same heart, that stuff is not close encounters. I mean, these are the kinds of films that they've got heart. And, um, and it's something we can get back. We just have to decide. You've said in the past, I don't see my work as being about trauma. I see all my work as being about triumph. And you cannot triumph if you do not know what you're overcoming. That's right. <laughs> I did say that. No. <laughs> <laughs> I did say that. I, 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 where, where is that coming from? Um, it comes from, you know, uh, the idea that comes to mind, and she, she, I don't even know if she's still here, but um, it comes from, uh, uh, does anyone remember the Oprah Winfrey show? It was a little show. <laughs> That show, there she is, over there. So much, so much good came from looking at the tough stuff. Um, so much that we talk about in our society now wasn't being talked about when she was even doing that show. Um, and 
you'd get to the end of one of those shows where she was talking about tough stuff. And, you know, two days later, she'd give you Tom Cruise or she'd give you Jennifer Aniston. She'd give you that. She'd mix it up. But really talking about, you know, AIDS, you know, gay folk, you know, civil rights, spirituality, you know, assault, you know, like all the big stuff. It's the tough stuff. But when you get to the end, you get the triumph pieces. We talk about all that stuff very openly now. You've got to peel, take off the Band-Aid, look at it, put the medicine on, give it a little bit of air for it to heal. And I think that those are the films that I make. I don't see enough uh, occasions in our society now, in our culture, where we can do that. I don't know what the equivalent of that show is now, where you can bring people together and talk about the hard stuff to get to a better place. And I don't see it happening in cinema either. And so instead of complaining about it, you know, which I could do all day and which would actually be fun, um, you know, we've decided to just try to, to, to go our own way. I think for the first maybe 15 years of my career, I was really about disrupting existing systems. I wanted to try it. I sat on every board, Academy Board, for the Oscars, for the Emmys, the DGA, Directors Guild, all the boards. I was on all the boards. Um, and be, being on those rooms, I just thought, wow, I'm spending so much time, tr time trying to change this 100-year-old system that was not built for me, it was not looking out for me, not made for me, and it's doing OK, it thinks. Um, and why not spin that? So about five years ago, we pivoted and started to say, you know what, new systems. You know, uh, 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 Mr. Carville was talking about, I think it was Mr. Carville was talking about the idea of, or was it Meacham? I don't know, someone brilliant, was talking about America as an idea. You know, you, you, you got to start with the idea of it. And instead of trying to beat my head against the wall, dealing with the old country, we're trying to, you know, found a new country and a new way of, for artists to engage with audiences more directly, to say the things that are on their heart, to connect with people in an intimate way, uh, and, and, and find new ways to actually monetize that, to actually make it so that it's substantive and um, sustainable. What kind of le legacy, Eva, are you hoping to leave with all this work? Um, I don't know. I, I, I guess the legacy is I'd like to see it, um, I'd like to see it all matter. You know, I was talking to a young filmmaker uh, about a year ago uh, who was really longing to be, get into the Sundance Film Festival, which was a huge film festival for me, for you too, right? Significant film festival in our industry. Uh, has launched a lot of people. And I said something about Mr. Redford. And they were like, Robert Redford? I said, yeah, Robert Redford, the founder of the Sundance Film Festival. I was like, Robert Redford was the founder of the Sundance Film Festival? <laughs> I literally almost dropped my mic. I said, it's just Sundance. It's just Sundance. And it's just what Sundance means. It's just about the, you know, uh, the, 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 the integrity of independence and those voices mattering. And does it really matter that that person didn't know it was Robert Redford at the end of the day, although I was shocked? No, because Sundance continues on. For It's the same thing with the Ray. They don't, they don't need to know it was me. The legacy of the ideas, you know, can it continue on? Can it, you know, break open new paths so that one day people, it's not even about the brand itself, but the ideas. Um, we're all forgettable, uh, but the things we do, what we say and who we impact is what reverberates. That's what lives on. The ideas, the, the, the integrity, the intention, I believe that's what echoes. And so I hope that could be it. Thank you, Eva. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks.